What's up guys, and welcome to another video. Beverly Potts went missing in 1951 and was only 10 years old. I can't imagine losing a kid that young, and my deepest condolences go to the family. Today we will dive deep into what happened to little Beverly and the scary theories regarding her disappearance. So let's get into it. Beverly Rose Potts was born in Cleveland, Ohio, to Robert and Elizabeth Potts. Beverly, who lived with her parents and her 22-year-old older sister Anita, was scheduled to start the fifth grade at Louis Agassiz Elementary School in the fall of 1951. Her father had bought the family's modest house in a middle-class Cleveland, Ohio neighborhood in 1927. Her mother was a stay-at-home mom, while her father was a stagehand at the Allen Theater in downtown Cleveland where he put in very long hours, and it is reported that Anita was employed by the National Cash Register Company as a clerk. On a side note, Potts's father's ethnicity was of English, Irish, and Scottish ancestry, whereas her mother was of Hungarian ancestry. Anyways, Beverly was dubbed Rosebud by her mother because she was tall for her age. By 1951, she looked a good two years older than her ten years of age, but she still liked to play with dolls and other kid-like toys. She was regarded as an attentive and popular student who typically achieved B grades. Additionally, Potts's best friend, 11-year-old Patricia Patsy Swing, would comment that although she was usually shy and friendly, she occasionally lost her temper and disliked being the target of mean jokes. Also, something I'd like to mention is that her parents enforced a rigorous curfew on her during her entire childhood, threatening to ground her if she failed to return home by the time set by them. Beverly had asked her mother to attend an annual performance on the 24th of August at Halloran Park. Her mother didn't want her to go at all, but since her daughter loved performing arts and she had been excited about seeing the show, her mother had agreed to allow her to attend this performance event as long as she promised to come home right away. Now let's get into the day of the performance. The estimated 1,500 people who had gathered at the park by 9.30 p.m. were starting to head home. At this time, a 13-year-old boy named Fred Krauss saw a girl he thought was Potts walking diagonally across the park in a northeastern direction, which was the fastest way for her to get home. Fred lived on the same street as Beverly, and he frequently passed her house on his newspaper route, even delivering the paper to her home. Krauss was able to identify Potts, despite the limited visibility caused by the approaching darkness and the four streetlights on Linnet Avenue, which were partially covered by maple and chestnut trees that bordered the street during the spring and summer. Potts' unique walking style, which he and other kids in the neighborhood had nicknamed, quote, duck-like, allowed him to identify her. All Krauss did was honk his horn and drive right by her. There was another witness who said they saw her walking by a roughed-up Dodge Coupe with a noisy muffler around the times of 8.30 and 9.30. One of the final potential sightings of Potts occurred at approximately 9.45 p.m., close to the intersection of West 110th Street and Baltic Avenue. This sighting was reported by an unidentified woman who told investigators she saw a dark-colored 1948 coupe being driven by a man she thought to be in his 40s, speeding north on Baltic Avenue with a child on the back seat who was distressed and screaming, quote, I want to get out, repeatedly, with her hands bound behind her back. When Beverly didn't return home, the Potts family rang the Swing family, who also had a daughter at the same school as Beverly, only to find out that their daughter had arrived home nearly an hour earlier, and that Potts had stayed at the park alone. Her sister and father started searching the area right away, first going over the path where Beverly had taken to Halloran Park, 
and then searching the park itself. After that, the family search was extended to include any nearby streets and places she might have been before the two left for home. Her sister made a futile attempt to call Beverly's friends' houses, and the family went to the nearby homes of other close friends who were without a phone. They discovered their child wasn't at any of these homes. The Potts called the police to report Beverly missing about an hour later at 10.57 p.m. after they had not seen their little Beverly. It would not be long after midnight before the first officers reached the Potts residence. Her bicycle was still in the family garage and she had not brought any additional clothing with her when she left. Police got to work right away, searching the neighborhood and questioning friends, acquaintances, and anyone who was known to have visited Halloran Park to find Potts. A statewide manhunt was launched by daylight on August 25th to find her, and over the next few weeks, many suspects were taken into custody and questioned. It is reported that one of the detectives assigned 45 full-time officers to the child's search. Investigators quickly concluded that Potts' home life had been stable and by all accounts happy, and there didn't seem to be any reason for her to have run away. So her family members were quickly cleared of all suspicions. Additionally, all three consented to take polygraph tests, which they all passed. Potts's mother told investigators that on August 24th, her daughter was looking forward to the family's planned trip to Euclid Beach Park, which they were supposed to leave for the morning after she vanished. It is reported that more than a thousand volunteers helped the police conduct a thorough search for the child. Aside from canvassing neighborhoods door to door, the search involved tracing suspicious cars, looking through vacant lots, sewers, and wasteland in the area, and using two civil air patrol planes to survey potential areas of interest, including reservations along the Rocky River and Edgewater Park, as well as open railway cars. Unfortunately, these avenues yielded no results. Potts's disappearance and her family's ongoing struggle received extensive coverage from all three statewide television stations, as well as editorials. The family granted multiple interviews in which they expressed their belief that their daughter had been abducted and was being held against her will, stressing in one interview, quote, she's being held by someone. Beverly is too shy to go along willingly. She was so shy nothing could have enticed her to go with anyone. She'd been earnestly warned about talking with strange people. The majority of news reports and newspaper articles featured pictures of Potts, along with details about her appearance, what she was wearing at the time of her disappearance, updates on the investigation, and by Tuesday after her disappearance, a police artist's sketch of the child dressed in what she had on the night she vanished. Public requests for information accompanied every media broadcast and piece of writing, and investigators routinely provided updates on the status of their investigations. In the days that followed Potts's disappearance, detectives determined that two possible explanations for the child's absence were that she had either been sexually assaulted or kidnapped and held for ransom before a detective brought the mail to the Potts household. All mail was intercepted and screened for ransom demands or obscene hoaxes. No ransom note was received in the days or weeks that followed Potts's disappearance. As a result, it was quickly ruled out that the child had been abducted for ransom. Investigators were highly suspicious that the child had been forced into a car or lured into a home near Halloran Park, and that the real reason for the kidnapping was therefore sexual. They also suspected that the perpetrator was probably a local person whom Potts knew, at least visually. But here's what's strange. A five-year-old Lakewood girl 
named Gail Ann Michelle, had been kidnapped from a nearby department store three months before Potts vanished in May 1951. Eighteen hours later, the child was discovered unharmed but abandoned. Two teenage girls had been sexually raped in Halloran Park that same month, and three local women had been raped in areas near the Potts residence just a few weeks before Potts vanished. On August 26, every known sexual offender living on Cleveland's west side, whether or not they had a preference for children, was also questioned about where they were on the day that Potts vanished. Following that, 65 people were removed from the investigation. The Potts family made a public appeal to Beverly's abductor a week after she vanished. They said they had come to terms with the possibility that Beverly was dead and begged for her body to be returned so the child could be given a respectable Christian burial. They said, quote, we have finally come to the realization we will never see our Beverly alive again. We urge whoever did this terrible thing to write or telephone us or the police about the location of Beverly's body so that we can reclaim and give her a decent Christian burial. It is reported that some people believe a man named William Ross Slates is behind this, and he is one of the main suspects in the disappearance. It is well known that the day following Potts's disappearance, Slates abruptly left the neighborhood after fraudulently borrowing a friend's car. After his 17-year-old girlfriend's phone calls were tracked down by the police, he was soon found at a Columbus hotel and brought back to Cleveland. Dale Smallwood and Fraser Jenkins, two of Slates' friends, gave different and contradictory versions of what happened the night Potts vanished, and Slates himself was unable to provide a convincing reason for his sudden departure from Cleveland. When Slates answered questions about Potts' kidnapping on a polygraph, the results raised suspicions among the police about his possible involvement. However, there was no tangible proof that connected Slates to the child. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? For decades, the public and media in Cleveland have been captivated by the enduring mystery surrounding Potts' disappearance, but ultimately fruitless. Some reports claim that Potts' disappearance made parents more concerned about the safety of their kids and that many kids who grew up in and around the city were severely chaperoned for years after the incident. Investigators are still looking for information in one of Cleveland's most notorious missing persons cases, and a $15,000 Crime Stoppers reward is still available. What do you think happened to Little Beverly? Let me know in the comments. I want to thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about what happened to little Beverly in the comments below. Until next time, guys, thanks, and my deepest condolences go out to Beverly's family.